I said Petitpas always worked within a story. Uh, now Balanchine, he was born in Russia at the beginning of the 20th century when Petipa was still alive. And he trained in the school that Petipa eventually directed, and he danced at the Imperial Theater, which was steeped by this time in Petipa's Russian tradition. Now he will leave Russia after the revolution and eventually make his way to New York, where together with Lincoln Kernstein, he founds the New York City Ballet. But he is very much seen as the inheritor of the Petipa tradition. And he will revitalize ballet. But what he does, he builds on what Petipa did. He builds on the idea of pure dance. But he abandons the story. He doesn't bother anymore with the story. Balanchine did very few story ballets. Most of his ballets were uh, plotless ballets. So he's taken this tradition that Petipa created of classical ballet about form and structure, and he just takes it a, a step further by not even bothering with the story anymore. And he will also sort of build on this classical ballet vocabulary and push the technique past where it had ever been pushed before. I just have a few images here from a ballet that he did in 1946 for temperaments. And you'll see from these images that he gives classical ballet a whole new look. He inverts it, he distorts it, he has them on point, but he'll have them flex their feet, work on bent knees. He moves to extreme positions, have some you know, pushing off point, lots of abrupt changes in direction, uh, takes partnering in new places that have never been taken before, all with an added speed and energy that he picked up from his adopted city, New York. Uh, and not only does he abandon story, eventually he pretty much abandons costumes and sets too, because for him it's important that we see, really see, and not be distracted by anything, that we see the beauty of the technique and see the steps that he's doing. So uh, all that's left is the movement and a very uh, intimate conversation with the music itself. But every now and then, Balanchine looked backwards. He was mindful of his history. And one time followed his trip uh, to Scotland. Now, the New York City Ballet had been invited to perform at the Edinburgh Festival. And while there, Balanchine went to see a Scottish military tattoo. Now, some of my students, when I was teaching this to them, didn't know what a military tattoo was. So just in case you don't, uh, I want to give you a sense of what it was that Balanchine got so excited about. Okay, so these marching bands just come in through the, from the gates of the castle, moving into the esplanade, band after band after band, and then of course there's this wonderful display of Highland dancing. So as uh, he loved it. He, he, he's quoted many times as saying he just loved it. And when he got back to New York, he decides to do a ballet about Scotland. So he, he knows Mendelssohn's Scotch Symphony, uh, so he uses that music. But he knew his ballet history. Balanchine couldn't think about Scotland and ballet without thinking about La Sulfide. Now, whereas La Sulfide is like a novel. Scotch Symphony is like a poem. La Sulfide tells a story. But Scotch Symphony, like poetry, just creates an atmosphere and makes these allusions back to La Sulfide. It's all very ambiguous, and nothing is quite resolved. The ballet was made for four couples, plus three soloists, two boys and a girl, and a principal couple principal boy and girl. And when you see the ballet at the Spring Showcase, watch for the deft manner in which Balanchine weaves suggestions of marching bands and Scottish Highland dancing into the classical ballet vocabulary. But he does more than that. He has a, a girl in the three soloists. The girl is like an Effie character. She is a grounded, down-to-earth, spunky, 
real girl to, for whom he gives this wonderful, brilliant, sparkling uh, choreography. But the principal couple, there's another of the, the girl, the principal couple, they're very reminiscent of James and the sylph. She's not a sylph, we don't think. But Balanchine originally created the work for Maria Tallchief, and later he was teaching it to someone else. And apparently this other dancer said to him, well, what am I? Am I a sylph or am I a girl? And Balanchine's answer was, just do the steps the way I tell you. <laughs> he wouldn't answer the question. So she's a sylph-like girl. It's not resolved. But I showed you the clip from La Sylphide where in that ballet, the sylphide keeps trying to draw James away. Well, in Scotch Symphony, there are a number of moments that will be repeated so you'll be able to catch them, where she takes James and she tries to lead him away. It's right out of La Sylphide. And of course, remember when James tried to follow the sylphide in the clip that I showed you, the sister sylphs came between him and the object of his desire? Well, Balanchine turns that on, his he on its head. In Scotch Symphony, the Scotch boys keep getting in between him and the sylph, very definitely and clearly barring his way. So again, another th suggestion of La Sylphide. Um, and there's another wonderful moment where two of the Scots boys pick up this sylph-like girl and place him on the principal boy's chest. When it was originally done with Maria Tallchief, they actually threw her. Uh, which was supposed to sort of be reminiscent of when Taglioni actually flew on the wires. Nobody does that anymore, and I actually saw an old video of it being done that way with Maria Tallchief, and <laughs> it always looked like they were about to knock her over. So I'm not surprised nobody does it anymore, but that's what he was alluding to there. So uh, each of these moments, these allusions to La Sylphide, are repeated several times in Scotch Symphony, so you'll be able to catch them, watch them for sure. And as I said, towards the very end of the ballet, they all line up in these rows perpendicular to the front of the stage, and they almost sort of march in place like the marching band and the military tattoo. It's a wonderful, wonderful ballet full of these really special enigmatic moments that reflect back on the past. So again, back to my sort of framework for this, this was Balanchine, innovating in the future, but always being mindful of where ballet had come from.